Amen. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew, stay standing if you could and honor God's word. If you're able to stand, please stand. I'm looking at you. If, if you, you know, I'm looking at people that, that, that cannot stand, but they still stand. Mary Lewis, good to have you with us. God bless you. And Miss Joyce, you keep her in line back there, okay? You, you do that. But it, I think it's a very honorable to always watch the people that cannot even stand, they're able to stand. But if you can't stand, please, by all means, for a health issue, please remain standing. But one day that you're, you're going to be able to stand 100% completely when the Lord gives you a new body. This week has been a very uh, tough week. It's been a long week uh, uh, with a few funerals and other opportunities of ministry. Uh, but I just want to say, as, as I went and, and led uh, uh, Jocelyn's um, uh, celebration of life, uh, here's, here's what I spoke to them about. Every good and perfect gift comes from heaven above. That when Jocelyn was born, immediately by the blood of Jesus, she was a child of God already. And her name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life because of her condition. Amen? And, and if you would have seen her, they opened the casket at the end. If you would have seen her body, it was amazing. Crazy. I just could not believe what I was seeing. Just like she was just right there asleep in front of us. But we know that absence to be body is to be present with the Lord. And we know she's with the Lord. So I praise God for her. So we continue to pray for her. For Ross and, and Gracie as they had lost some loved ones. Uh, in Matthew, it's an incredible account here that answers the question, who is Jesus? But the question is to us, who is Jesus to you? That's what I want to speak to you about. So in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, let's begin in verse 13. There where uh, Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you... Who do people say that the Son of Man is? I want to know, what are people saying about the Son of Man? And they said, some say that John the Baptist, others that it's Elijah, and others that it's Jeremiah, or maybe one of the uh, uh, prophets. And in verse 15, he said to them, but, but who do you say, who do you say that, that I am? Not what others are saying, but what are you saying? Who do you say that I am? And Simon, the very first spokesman that I always want to speak first, and he comes out and, and jumps right out of the, the, the races, and he says, Simon Peter replies, he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, teach, because you're the greatest teacher of all. I thank you for, for dads, Lord, and husbands that are here with their families. I thank you for moms, single moms that sacrifice, Lord, regardless if a husband or, or even a husband with a, a wife doesn't come, they're faithful and they're here. I thank you for these children that are here, and I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that everything that's said here today will open and speak the, the eye to the eyes and the hearts of the youngest to the oldest, because that's what you can do. That's what you did for me and for so many, Father. So do your work, Father. We ask you, give us grace and mercy. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. I'm going to ask for, for, for no, no one to be moving around. Once we start this time, we're actually already in a, in a special place of, of holiness and worship. So uh, mom said, Dad, this is an opportunity for you to teach your children to be still. Okay? I know Gladys, Grandma, gave her grandchildren a dollar each. She gave them a dollar each for the offering. And when, she, when I saw that this morning before service, it reminded me of when my mom would give us change. I was so excited to give somebody else's money. <laughs> that was easy. As a matter of fact, one of her grandchildren says, do y'all have a vending machine? <laughs> well, if you did, Grandma said, you ain't going to use it for that. That's for the church, you know. And so these are teaching moments. These are moments that you teach. And the other thing is, if you have a conversation of those with someone, I hope it's a conversation about what's being talked about in the service. But the only conversation we should be having is with the Lord. Because if not, what we do is we become a distraction. And I don't mind sharing this to, with you because it's, it's a teaching moment for us. Because if we can start teaching people how to worship, how to be disciplined in, in church, and when we hear the word of God and give honor and respect, let me tell you something. It is, it is life. It is medicine for the soul. It is hope. It is encouragement. And the last thing we want anybody to miss any of that. Amen? So let's, let's, let's teach. Let's teach our families. As a matter of fact, there's a picture that you're going to put up there for me. Uh, Brenda, thank you for sending that. That is uh, the great Maximus, okay? The gladiator Maximus with Ethan this morning, my grandson. And that was captured by, I, I, I guess, you took that picture? Okay, how much old are you? Anyway, so what uh, a wonderful picture that we have children that are learning about Jesus. And moms and dads, if your children are not in Bible study learning about Jesus, well, hopefully that we're teaching them at home, number one. But what an opportunity. And it, 
you know, we have extended a teaching hour right now where they're teaching them about Jesus right now. They're in there not just playing, they're praying with them. Okay? That's who we are. And, and you know, I'd, I'd rather have Ethan there learning about Jesus. And I had a talk with him today. Because even Ethan says, you know, Grandpa, can we stay home and play with the trains? You know, he's four. And I say, I explained to him, said, let me tell you why we go to church. And we had a little sit down. And, and, and it's important for them to know. But when they get here, they will absorb of the goodness of God. They're not playing a video game. They're looking at a book that tells them about Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 So this is, this is who we are. This is our church. And I want you to know when you bring your children to any of our ministries that you entrust them for us to teach them, whether they're children, youth, or college students, because that's what we do and we love to do. So the question is, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Jesus and his disciples in the context of this, 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 this uh, verse that we just read there in chapter 16, uh, we find that his disciples are in the coast of uh, Caesarea of Philippi. That's where they are. That's where the scene is at. And what you need to understand, what I need to understand, is that this was here, the place, the city, that was devoted to worship of idols and man-made gods. And Jesus chooses this location. He chooses this place to bring about a fuller revelation of himself to his disciples. And he does it in this kind of condition. It was also here that Simon Peter saw for the first time that, that Jesus Christ was truly the Son of God. Jesus used this tragic backdrop of paganism, of false worship, to cause his men to think about the most vital issue of life, and that issue is, who is Jesus to you? Now, in the same way Jesus is speaking to us in these times, do, you, do, you, do we have a perfect community, a perfect world? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, we need to continue to pray for Israel. Israel was just attacked by Iran. And if you don't see the news, well, you got breaking news, right? And you need to be aware of what's going on. I don't mean that you have to watch the, the 10 o'clock news every day or be bombarded by that and get depressed with all the bad news. But listen, one reason you need to know what's going on is so you can pray for our nation. You can pray for one another. Something could be happening in the community. You don't know about it. You're not aware about it. And the church needs to be alert because the devil, he is sneaky. He's out there to seek and to find, to devour and destroy Everything and anyone that gets in his path because he wants to rule you. He wants to rule our country. He wants to rule our world. So pray for Israel. But he uses, uh, Jesus uses this time. And, and think about it. Why is it that he didn't go back to the Garden of Gethsemane, kind of just a place, a quiet place, peaceful place? Listen, because he wanted to teach them that in spite of all this paganism, in spite of all this rolling he's around them, that Jesus could still do what he does best and change the lives of heart and bring to attention and the knowledge, like Peter, to show him that he was the Son of God. And only God could show him that. Blood could not reveal that. That was the Lord. Correctly understanding who Jesus is means the difference between being saved and being lost. You understand who Jesus is. You know how many atheists, other people, they go through other religions. When they really, really search and they find God... And the Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior. It is life-changing. So the first thing I want us to look at is, is let's ask humanity. What, what, what did humanity say about who Jesus was? What have men said in the past? So if, if you love taking notes, if you want to write things, we're going to go through a lot of Scripture. This is a great time to get your pens, your pencils, your, your phone, and get that stuff on there. Because it's something that's good to go back to. So here we go. Let's launch this. What have men said in the past? Well, during the life of Christ, men had a lot to say. I mean, a whole lot to say about him and, 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 and who they, they thought that he was. Uh, for instance, look at ver verse 14. We read that. You know, some, some say that he's Elijah, others John the Baptist, Jeremiah, and some other the prophets. So there it shows us who some thought that Jesus was to be or some thought of who he was. So Here's John the Baptist. So they thought he was John the Baptist. Who was John the Baptist? John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 14, 1 through 2, it tells us that he was a holy man. He was willing to die for his faith. Even King Herod at the time uh, thought that Jesus was John the Baptist that was raised from the dead. And Elijah was the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. The Jews were expecting Elijah to return just before the Messiah came. You can read that in Malachi 4.5. Uh, and some believe that Jesus was the forerunner, but not the Messiah. 
And thirdly, Jeremiah. You have Jeremiah, the, the great prophet, a holy prophet, who was expected to return to earth just before the Messiah came. He was supposed to bring with him the tabernacle of the Ark of the Covenant and the altar of the incense, which he had hidden in Mount Nebo before he died. And then you have one of the prophets, a man of God, sent with a message for their time. Or a man in whom dwelt the spirit of one of the great prophets. Now I want you to note that all of these views elevated Jesus above the status of an ordinary man. And what they show us is shows that, that the Jews, at least they believed, at least they believed him to be a great man. They even believed that, that Jesus was a holy man. But their views of him, they fell far short of what is required for salvation and what we need to have for salvation. Not every, everyone in Jesus' day thought that he was a great man. Even today, not everyone believes that he was a great man. Some thought that he was nothing more than a nobody, and some even thought that he was an evil man. In Mark 6, 3, we, we're seeing that he was known as a lowly carpenter. In John 6, 42, we see that he was a son of Joseph. In John 9, 24, a sinner. In John 8, 41, an intelligent child. In Matthew 12, 24, a devil. And John 10, 20, a mad man. This is what others thought and who Jesus was. But the question is now to us, not just what humanity thought, but what does man say now in the present? What do people think that Jesus is? So that's where we, you have all these different religions that come about. So let me just kind of run through because just as men had an opinion concerning the identity of Jesus Christ in this day, so they still do today. And here's what some of the people were saying or even are saying today about Jesus. The first thing is the Jehovah Witness. Have you ever heard of the Jehovah Witness? Okay. Let me tell you something about the Jehovah Witness. One good thing about them. They're faithful. They're everywhere. They're knocking on your door and my door. If not, they send you a letter. During COVID, they, they did that very good, sending you letters and things like that. But let me tell you about the Jehovah Witness, if you don't know anything of them. Michael the Archangel is no other than the only begotten Son of God, now Jesus Christ. That's what they believe. The Mormons, Jesus is our elder brother, was begotten in the flesh by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden. And who is our father in heaven? And they believe that Lucifer, the son of the morning, is our elder brother and the brother of Jesus. It's the Mormons. Islam. Islam teaches that Jesus is no more than a mortal, okay, mortal, whom Allah favored and made an example of the Israelites. They are unbelievers who say that God is Messiah, Mary's son. It's what they believe. Jesus was a prophet, but he was not crucified on the cross, and he will return, but he is not God. That's what they believe. And the Hindu, Jesus is just one of millions of gods. That's what they believe. Well, you see, what we need to know, church, that all of these people are, and groups, they have ideas. They have ideas about Jesus, but none of them are biblical ideas. Since humanity cannot help us determine the identity of Jesus, then what we need to do is we need to ask Jesus. So let's ask Jesus. That's who we should ask. What a person says, by the way, about himself is also important in discussing his identity. Here are some of the things that Jesus said about himself, biblically, scripturally. In John 14, verse 9, he said, he hath seen me. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Amen? In John 10, 30, he said, I and my Father are one. In John 8, 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. 
Can I go on, church? Can I go on? Because in John 6, 35, it says that he is the bread of life. In John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. And God knows we need light in this world. In John 10, 9, he says, I'm the door. I love it. He's the greatest door that man can ever open. In John 10, 11, he says, I'm the good shepherd. And he is good. He is good. In John 10, 36, he says, I'm the son of God, period. In John eleven twenty five, 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And that should bring you hope. And John 14, verse 6, I am the way, I am the truth of the life. And John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine. Don't go be digging up anywhere else. I'm it. And if you tap into me, he says, when you become a child of his, he becomes in us and we in him and we dwell with him. We dwell. That's what Jesus said on himself. I mean, there's so much, but we could be here a long time. So let's ask our own hearts. Who is Jesus? Let's, let's look into our hearts. Who is Jesus? Because in the pages of the Bible, several people had a personal encounter. And this is probably one of my favorite parts of the, of the message because I'm going to give you like a little bit glimpse of the Bible, of, of the things that happened. Several people had personal encounters with Jesus Christ that forever changed their lives. So I want to share a few of those statements about Jesus with you today. And before I go to share those things, have you ever heard different testimonies of people in their encounter with Jesus? Don't they bless you? They're still happening today. God is still changing lives. He changes the rate. There are testimonies that continue to be written. Young people, these, these three children right here, they're here. Listen, they're, right, they're listening. And, 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 and what's happening is that God is doing a work in them. He's already working in you, children. Or listen, Victoria, God loves you so much. And when you hear that, it, it, it penetrates you. So that when you become that teenager, you can remember that seed of the gospel that was planted in you. So they can, you can just not just be a hearer, but you can be a doer. And don't, don't say that you can't. You can in Jesus' name. Don't, you don't have to follow the crowd. You don't have to do what everybody else. Be different in the difference. Stand. Stand for Jesus. Stand, stand for righteousness. And here is one, Sa Simon. There was a story of Simon in Luke chapter 2, verse 28 and 32, where he said, Mine eyes have seen thy salvation, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. Wow, what a testimony. Nathaniel, one of my favorite ones, Nathaniel, in John chapter 1, verse 49, he said, Rabbi, and that simply means teacher, teacher, uh, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Remember the woman at the well? John 4, 29, come. And she goes, once she met Jesus and she, she found out that he is a true living water, come and see a man which told me all the things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? And by the way, one of the things he he told her is how she was living. She was living in sin. You know, she had been divorced. Most she has had different men in her life. And the one that she was, she was not even married to. But you know what? He loved her. And he wanted to make a change in her life. He challenged her. And then we have Martha in John chapter 11, verse 27, where she said, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Amen. She said she believed. And the Roman centurion, finally, when Jesus says, it is finished. It's been paid in full. Darkness covered the earth. The, the graves opened. The veil tore from top to bottom. All these things happened. And he took his last breath. And the Roman centurion looked at him in Mark 15, verse 39. He says, truly, this man was the son of God. It's never too late to know and recognize who Jesus Christ is. And that man, I believe, came to know Jesus. Just like the thief on the cross. Because he saw with his eyes and he began to believe and he professed. And we spoke about Thomas. Remember last week, Dad on Thomas? In John chapter 20, 24 and 28, we looked at that where he said, finally he said, my Lord, my God. Isn't that awesome? It's a testimonies of what and who people proclaim who Jesus was. Let's hear from our hearts. We have heard from man today. We have seen that among humans, there have been those that have denied that Jesus is the Son of God and the only way of salvation. They've denied it, and they created other ways. They've teaching, they, and they have movements. They tried to lure people away from the truth. 
And I'll tell you a big, big signal when you find out that it is a cult and there's something that is not of God. When the leader of that organization says, worship me, run, run. When he says, give me all your money for him so he could build his little mansions all over and have airplanes all over the place, run, run. When he himself does not humble himself and serve and lead the church as a servant of God and just points people to do things, you run. You run. Those are indications of false doctrines. People want to make something for themselves. So we've seen how people try to convince people and not show the right way, the only way to salvation, that is Jesus. We have, all, we have other testimony from lives that have been changed by him. We read that. These indicate that he is who he claims to be and their lives that are still being changed. We have heard enough to be convinced that Jesus Christ is someone about whom we must make a decision today. And that's what every day, every Sunday, when you come in this place, you and I have to make a decision. We have to show our, our children and our young people, hey, introduce them to the greatest master of all masters, the king of kings, Jesus Christ. But they have to make a decision. So with that in mind, what does your heart say about him today? What does what, what your heart speak about him today? Is he just a baby? Is he just a baby at Christmas and, and, and a, a guy at the cross on Easter? Or is he the crucified and risen Lord and Savior of your life is he a way to God just among many or is he really is he the way the truth and the life is he a good man a great teacher and a prophet or is he the son of God your only hope for salvation is he a liar is he a lunatic or is he your Lord the boss of your life are you trusting in Jesus and him alone for salvation of your own soul? And as we go to a time of, of, of uh, re, uh, rededication of our life and, 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 and reflecting our lives here in a little bit in worship, uh, those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves. Are we trusting Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation today? If you are, then you are on the right track. But if you trust it in anything else other than Jesus, then be careful. As our worship team comes, let us hear from the Bible one more time. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, the Bible says, If you confess, if you confess with your mouth and believe, confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised his son Jesus from the dead, the Bible says that you will be saved, that you will be saved. The question is, where do you stand? Where do you stand in the midst of all this? Who is Jesus to you? Because Simon Peter got the right answer. He got the right answer. He said there, what, in verse 16, you see that? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what he said. He, he only got it right because the answer had been revealed to him by the Lord. And that's what it says in verse 17, that you got it right because I showed you. And you received it. God opens our eyes, our hearts. You might be asking yourself right now, what should I do with Jesus? What do I do with him? Well, one day the question will be, what would Jesus do with me? Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray, Lord, today that the name that's above all names, the great name of Jesus, the holy name was been revealed to our spirits. Father, I know I've seen, Lord, in churches where just one or two decide to follow Jesus. That church life and community changed for generations to generations. Father, we're short teachers. Grow within our young people, our children, future teachers that teach the Bible, that have a love for the Bible. Father, we need worshipers, Lord. 
worshipers that worship in spirit. Father, we need people that have a, a desire, Lord, once they know you, Lord, to evangelize, to, to bring others to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we need homes, Lord, to be godly homes. Forgive us, Lord, for we have failed you. But give us a new day, a new start today to chase after the things of God, the things that Jesus died for, and the things that are required for a disciple, a learner of Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. The altar is open, and one of the most beautiful things that I would love to see, if the Lord leads you to, is bring your family. Bring your family. Make a commitment that you will teach your family who Jesus is. But before you can do that, you've got to figure out, is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Because you can't lead your children in that path if you don't know the path. So I want you to come, and I want our leaders not to stay in the pew. Our leaders, come and pray. When was the last time you came and prayed with our people? Help me out and pray because I believe families will come today. And let's pray with them. Let's encourage them. And if you want to see me afterwards, I'll make time. Ethan can hang out here and I want to talk to you. I want to minister to you through the week. Whatever it takes, let's come together as a church. Because he's already brought you a little closer. A little closer. Remember when you were back there? Remember when you were in the back? And every day God's working. He's working. He's building you up. And he's bringing you peace. He's putting you back together. And now you're back at the front of the feet of Jesus. And that's the best place to be at. Let's stand. You come and pray. I love you, Lord.